this is an interesting thing that you'll probably like. Have you ever heard me talk about the uh, Fermi paradox? No, oh, actually, no. Uh, well, you'll like this then. You know, the there is a thing called the Fermi paradox, and Enrico Fermi and and his friends sat around at lunchtime and did some calculations, assuming that because this is one of the newer parts of the, well, we're about in middle aged of the universe. You know, the older part of the universe is about a billion years older than us. About a billion years later, our part of the universe came about and another billion years newer than us part of the universe came around. So we're kind of in the middle someplace. And they said, well, if the part of the universe is a billion years older than us, then if it evolves sort of like us, then it would be a billion years ahead of us. Can you imagine what kind of technology and things you might have if we had another billion years? I mean, look what we've done in just the last 50 years. It's pretty impressive. A billion years. All right. So they looked at things and they came up with, with some equations that said, well, here's how uh, things tend to populate. You know, populations tend to grow. So, you know, there's models like that of population growth and they grow and grow and grow until they eat up all the food then they start to you know die off for some reason or they get diseases because they're too crowded and then they shrink and then they grow again and there's models of populations like that so they added that to this model and said all right these people a billion years ago if they started like us and they got to where we are now a billion years ago they would probably uh, overpopulate whatever it was they were on and would have to move on to something else, but they'd have technology way out ahead of us. So that wouldn't be a problem. And then they'd overpopulate that and they'd move on. So they did some mathematics that showed, you know, where would they be now? How far would they have likely populated out, populating everything that they could possibly populate until it got overcrowded and then move out to the next territory, you know? And they came to the conclusion that given that light speed was not you know, gotten past, you have to go sub light speed in traveling between these things uh, that uh, they should have been through our part of the universe a long, long time ago. Not only should they have been here a long time ago, but they should have every square inch of everything that's inhabitable here, like our moon, like Mars, like some of the moons of uh, Jupiter, maybe, you know, some of the things that are inhabitable should have all been populated to the max and already moved on. So they should have passed through here. And then the big, the paradox was, well, where are they? <laughs> yeah, where are they? I mean, they should be impossible to miss. It's not like there's going to be one spaceship roaming around in our galaxy. It's like this is overcrowded. And of course, they're part of the same universe. So they have to deal with electromagnetics and gravity and all the things we deal with, they have to deal with too. So there's going to be signatures here with this crowded space that they're in and so they're not here you know we yeah. don't see them and they couldn't all be invisible <laughs> you know that's even if they have that technology they consume resources they'd have heat they you know things would be there it's impossible for them to cover up all their footprints so where are they yeah. and it's it's considered to be a very strong uh paradox because the, the rationale in it was judged, you know, people have gone back and redone the math and redone the math and said, yeah, even making all very conservative, you know, assumptions about population and so on, even if you make real conservative assumptions, you still get to the same conclusion of where are they? Because a billion years is just a very long time. Uh, so anyhow, uh, there's a good answer to that paradox. Again, this, this model of mine just answers paradoxes, and this is a good one. I'm what happens is this is a virtual reality, okay? Now, the reason that everybody is certain that there must be other life somewhere in the universe is because there's literally trillions and trillions of suns, and there's just no reason why this little configuration we got here ought to be unique. Right, it shouldn't be unique. It ought to be replicated all over the place. So there's bound to be many, many, many other civilizations with people on it, or some kind of critters on them. They may not be like us, but something that suited that environment is bound to happen because it's just so big and so much of it, so many, so much potential. But if this is a virtual reality, consider the larger consciousness systems created this virtual reality for consciousness to help grow up. Now. In this 
in this particular planet, they've got about 8 billion seats in the simulator, okay, who are getting data streams. They have to produce about 8 billion data streams to uh, get this done. And their idea is that they are increasing the evolution of the whole, right? That's the whole point. All of these things, because the whole evolves with the pieces. Now, what's the cost of another data stream? And what's the advantage of another person evolving? Well, you know, uh, all systems have this curve that, you know, the, how they scale, you know, more is better, more is better, more is not so much better, more is worse, more is worse, more is worse. You've got some sweet point where you turn from more is better to more is not better. And it may be fairly even flat for a while on top, but eventually it goes downhill. So is 8 billion enough? <laughs> you know? Or is 8 billion... Oh, we could have 8 billion, you know, we could have a billion, 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 and one more added to that. Oh, yeah, that would be great and productive, worth another. Probably not. It's probably not that way. It's probably there's some number that is good. Now, I have been to other reality frames, at least it's, you know, this is how it seemed to me. This is my experience. And they were like this one, but it wasn't this one. But it was a tight rule set. And, you know, did it also have, you know, it, seem to not have as much population as we do. Well, let's say it only had 5 billion. And, but were there other things in it? I'm sure it had lots of suns and, <laughs> and things too, you know, trillions and trillions of suns. So you start looking at this and you're saying, well, I see way more, way more seats, you know, than would probably be worth it to the system. Because another, it's just not another data stream, but it's another calculation of how this individual interacts with all the others and the effects that they have on each other. And it's a, you know, it's not just a trivial thing to add another seat. It's a fair amount of work needs to be done to, to feed that, that seat and its interactions. So that then answers the question, is that all of those trillions of, of suns and their probable potential for life they're just dots in the sky. Why would that ever be rendered? Just like if you're not going to render my guts inside, you just remember what you, you just render what you see. That's all. So to us, those are just lights in the sky. They're dots of light in the sky. And to the Hubble telescope, well, they're big smears of gases and this and that and a lot of little stars and other kind of junk. But I only have to render that when the Hubble's turned on. Mm, so it's kind, to... of like tree, it's kind of like the tree in the forest. If it falls, if there's no one there to listen, there's no point. Then you look at it and say, well, maybe 8 billion seeds is enough, plus whatever it has in other places. Maybe that's enough. And maybe all of those just lights in the sky are nothing more than lights in the sky. And, you know, at nighttime, they, uh, they have to put lights in the sky. But in daytime, they don't even have to put lights in the sky. And if you don't have a telescope, they never have to put anything more than lights in the sky. And if you have a really big, expensive telescope, there's probably no more than a few dozen of those in the world anyway, well, then you have to give them another picture. But like we said, it's a random draw. What's, what's going to be there? Well, there's you know, 100 things that could be there. And here's a random draw from the probability distribution, the possibilities. That's what you show them. And then when, so, that, teles when that telescope looks elsewhere, you stop computing that. You don't compute that anymore. The telescope comes back, uh, you compute it. Telescope goes away, you compute what someplace else. And it's not much trouble at all. All the rest of that universe with its trillions and trillions of stars is not but that much effort for the larger yeah. cancer system. All of this is a couple of lights in the sky, and that's it. And there's not a lot of interaction. You know, there's not a lot of stuff it has to keep track of. It just has to keep track of what it's shown, what's been looked at, what it's shown. You know, and it does that very easily. So it, it's a trivial thing for it to, to not populate anything more than here because 8 billion is plenty and adding another one probably doesn't pay for itself as far as uh you know entropy lost for the total system and cost to the system matter of fact the 8 billion are probably more than it needs but it's going <laughs> to keep because it's going to keep doing it because we're you know we're here and we're doing things so it's kind of locked into this experiment and this thing is going on so it'll It'll do that, uh, perhaps. If it's way more than it needs, then I guess we'll get some 
some kind of terrible disease or some kind of big earthquake or a meteor will hit and uh, you know reduce the reduce the numbers. Something will happen to reduce the numbers down to something better. But in any case, that's the answer to Fermi's paradox. We're it, and it's not a waste of all this the billions of suns and planets at all. They don't really exist. They're never, they're never ever rendered. If we're so, not looking, it's not there. Right. We're not looking. It's not there. So it's not a waste of resources. It's not a waste of, of billions of planets and suns at all. There's no waste. Matter of fact, rendering that stuff just just to it's the a, point that we can see that it's there is trivial. It's almost nothing. It's probably less than just rendering one one data stream for an individual. It's probably trivial than the, you know, more trivial than that. So that's the perfect answer to the Fermi paradox: is that it's just us. This is a virtual reality. 